crane to the open hearth furnace. Under the direction of the melter, the molten pig iron is poured onto a spout and runs into the furnace. As the charges of limestone, scrap and pig iron cook together for up to 12 hours, various chemical reactions take place to remove unwanted elements. The oxidized materials are passed off as gas and other impurities in the iron enter the slag produced by the limestone. Strict records are kept of the batch or heat of steel, noting the temperatures, timings and materials charged. Samples are taken periodically for testing to make sure that specifications are met. At the back of the furnace, a ladle is heated and then moved into place for the tap of hot steel. The clay plug at the bottom of the furnace is broken with an explosive charge and over 225 tons of molten steel flow down the spout into the waiting ladle. At this point, small quantities of elements such as manganese and aluminum are added to the heat of steel to give the desired chemical composition or to make ferroalloys. Carbon may also be added. These additives give the steel special properties for specific end uses. As the ladle fills, the spout is raised to stop the flow of steel. The slag, which was on top of the steel in the open hearth, like cream on milk, now begins to fall onto the floor. Here, the hot steel is being delivered to the platform by crane. Transportation and handling of materials make up some 90% of steel making. The huge ladle is suspended over the ingot molds and the steel is poured or teamed from a bottom opening. Once again, the composition and temperature of the steel are tested. Our three basic ingredients have been transformed into steel, an alloy of iron and carbon. The steel is now ready to be shaped, but first it has to cool and solidify in the molds. When the ingots have solidified, they are taken to the yard where the stripper crane removes the molds. The rectangular ingots, weighing six or seven tons, are placed in brick-lined soaking pits for eight to ten hours to bring them to a uniform temperature suitable for shaping in the rolling mills. Once they have reached the desired temperature, 1200 degrees Celsius, the ingots are moved to the rolling mills. Now they are ready to be cogged or broken down into a semi-finished product known as blooms. This is done in the roughing mill. The ingots will get their final shape in the rail mill. In the rolling process, the hot ingot is squeezed or passed between two wide heavy wheels revolving at the same speed but in different directions just like the ringers of an old-fashioned washing machine. Each pass elongates the steel and makes it stronger by compacting its internal structure. Here, the steel is turned by a manipulator so that pressure can be applied equally to each side. The ingot goes through a number of passes to become a bloom. A bloom in the final stages of roughing can be seen as a new ingot enters the process. 
The blooms are then sheared to length in preparation for the rail mill. In the rail mill, the bloom begins to look like a rail. It moves cross country to other rolls in adjoining stands where it continues to be shaped. Operations are controlled from stations known as pulpits. The rails are cut to length by hot saw and the rail ends are taken for testing. Safety of the product is of prime importance in the steel industry. In the lab, a tiny sliver of steel from a rail is viewed under an electronic microscope for computerized quality testing. However, wet chemistry still plays an important role, especially in slag analysis. Other quality control and safety procedures include putting the rails through a retarded cooling period in an insulated box. This allows the diffusion of hydrogen from the rail, thus preventing internal ruptures known as shatter cracks. After every procedure, the rails are checked for external defects. The rails are straightened by a system of rolls which exerts tremendous vertical and horizontal pressure on the entire rail. To further straighten them, the ends of the rails are gagged with a hydraulic press. They are also inspected ultrasonically for internal defects. After all tests are completed, the rails are finally ready for shipment. In following the processes, from the raw materials to our finished product, rails, we've seen that making steel requires technological skill and scientific precision. Detailed care and accuracy go into measuring the massive amounts of materials, our ingredients, and testing them during every step for safety and quality. As the steel workers say, it's just like making a cake. Sydney Steel was built almost a century ago amidst the national excitement of industrialization, immigration, and urban growth. Natural resources, corporate politics, technology, and thousands of workers have all played roles in its development. Interwoven with the history of the steel industry, is the experience of a community that has given generations of work to the Sydney plant, all the while coping with danger, pollution, and the threat of closure. The community now takes strength from its own history of cultural diversity and working class solidarity as the industry faces change and decline. The better part of 40 years I have given to that mill, a plant that blossomed in its day has life within it still. Yes, history that gives these hands the strength of yesterday. When coal and steel and hearts were proud enough to hear us say, Sons of steel, people of the land, daughters strong, together we will stand. Hailed by the country's leaders as part of Canada's national dream, Dominion Iron and Steel Corporation, DISCO, 
opened its new plant and produced its first steel in December 1901. The plant was the brainchild of an American, Boston industrialist H. M. Whitney. With help from Montreal financiers and Nova Scotia politicians, Whitney made his Cape Breton coal interests the foundation of the new steel industry. Coal was the fundamental carbon fuel for steel making. Iron ore was shipped from Belle Island, Newfoundland. The other ingredient, limestone, was quarried on the Bredor Lakes. Sydney's excellent harbour was crucial to the new industry's location. Disco had blast furnaces, open hearth furnaces, and a large coke ovens battery. It had mills and shops, transportation and power systems, all for a state-of-the-art integrated operation. Its magnificent general office was a symbol of corporate power. The plant's American technology attracted visitors from all over. The promotional literature declared that every labor-saving device and the finest machinery known to modern scientific steelmaking have been installed. In its first decade, the plant was marketing a variety of products, including rails, rod and bar, and semi-finished steel. At the same time, the corporate boards of steel and coal were busy in Montreal. By 1910, a new holding company emerged, the Dominion Steel and Coal Corporation. Outside interests created disco. However, outside interests brought about the demise of the locally controlled Scotia Steel across the harbour at Sydney Mines. This plant, long known for its technical excellence, would be taken over and eventually closed in 1921 in favour of the Sydney plant. The steel boom caused incredible urban growth in Cape Breton. Streets and transportation services, water and sewage systems, and schools and banks appeared almost overnight. Steel was the source of development, new wealth, and influence. Steel was like a magnet, attracting thousands of workers to steady work and good pay. The population of Sydney grew by 600% in the 20 years since 1891. People came from rural Cape Breton and other maritime regions. Over half the immigrants came from Newfoundland. Others came from all over the world. As in other parts of Canada, the immigrants to Cape Breton were not always welcomed. Skilled workers, such as carpenters or machinists, came from the Maritimes or the United States. They were initially involved in the building and startup of the plant. They settled with their families in large, well-built company houses in the Ashby area near the plant. Sojourners were brought in to do specific jobs. Italian construction workers, Hungarian iron workers, and Afro-American steel makers. They were expected to leave as soon as their work was finished. The unskilled laborers were mostly young immigrants. Many were housed in the area known as Whitney Pier, right beside the steel plant on Sydney's east side. They lived in shacks run by local entrepreneurs or stayed in rooming houses. There might be as many as 50 men boarding in one house. The beds were often used in shifts corresponding with the shifts at the plant. 
management lived on the other side of town. After World War I, communities began to form around the steel industry. Women and children arrived to join their men. Settled at last with their families, the workers made permanent homes. They bought houses from the company or from developers, or built their own. The building materials for their new homes were distinctly North American, yet their use of space and the house styles they chose firmly imprinted the newcomer's identity on the landscape. Businesses also left an identifying mark on the steel community. Most of the early commerce was run by native-born Cape Bretoners. But after 1920, immigrant Jewish and Lebanese peddlers left their routes in rural Cape Breton and opened stores in town. The long-established businesses on Charlotte Street also flourished with the steel boom. Concern for the immigrants' adjustment to Canadian life was taken up by Christian social reformers. They set up missions to provide health services and language classes. The proper development of children was the focus of attention for those well-meaning workers of the social gospel. The ways of the old world were to be left behind. Despite the efforts of the social gospel, the immigrants held on to their own culture through their own religions. The women, especially, maintain the seasonal and religious customs, thus extending ethnic identity beyond the home. Religion blended spiritual devotion with family tradition and reinforced the values of each ethnic group that became part of a diverse community. For the workers at the plant, ethnicity determined what kind of job they got. In the skilled areas, immigrants could only be helpers. Most often, they were employed doing bulwark, such as carrying or cleaning, or in the dirtiest and most dangerous jobs. For many years, the company offered no protection against the constant threat of injury or death on the job. So workers formed benefit societies in their own ethnic or religious groups to provide insurance against the insecurity of a dangerous workplace. Benefit societies also acted as social networks, often shielding immigrants from the stigma of being different in a new land. Since there was no general union of steel workers until almost mid-century, early worker solidarity was based in ethnic groups or in the skilled trades. But even in the first years of the plant, workers staged walkouts and strikes, demanding fair wages and better working conditions. In 1904, government troops were brought in against the striking steel workers. The long and bitter strike of 1923 is still remembered for Bloody Sunday. On that day, provincial police assaulted workers and their families on the main street as they walked home from church. That strike was lost, but it was the beginning of a strong labor tradition. Sydney's steel plant saw more corporate changes in the 20s. It had come under the British Steel and Coal Corporation in 1920, and in 1929 reverted back to Dominion Steel and Coal. The head offices were still in Montreal. Despite the depression, DOSCO undertook some important technical improvements. It changed from steam to electricity, but its most unique innovation was the retarded cooling process developed at Sydney which is still a worldwide practice for ensuring the safety of rails. 
Dosco marketed a variety of products all across Canada, benefiting from the maritime freight rate subsidies. World War II increased production and employment. Almost a thousand women were hired, but most were laid off at the war's end. After the war, the plant appeared to thrive. It had 5,400 employees in 1949, and in the 1950s, a new open hearth was installed with much political ceremony. But in fact, the plant's aging technology was not able to keep up with the demand for cheap steel and specialty alloys. There were massive layoffs in the 50s and 60s, and many Cape Breton steel workers left for Hamilton and Sault Ste. Marie. In 1957, A.V. Rowe, a Canadian subsidiary of the British multinational Hawker Sidley, took control of Dosco with promises to revitalize the industry. But 10 years later, citing technological obsolescence and unsuitable geographic location, the company announced on October 13, 1967, Black Friday, that the plant would soon be closed. The Cape Breton community responded to the announcement of closure with a parade of concern. On November 20th, more than 20,000 marchers met with provincial and federal politicians. A month later, the Sydney Steel Plant became a provincial crown corporation, Cisco. The steel industry entered the 1970s with strong world markets. The decade might have been Cape Breton's best years for steel, but instead, much-needed modernizations were left incomplete and millions of dollars were wasted as Cisco became prey to political whim. The plant reduced its capacity to a single product, rails, despite repeated protests from the Steelworkers Union. Diversify or die, they said. Cisco stumbled on into the 1980s amidst uncertain markets, layoffs, rumors, and tragic accidents. Finally, in 1986, Nova Scotia's Premier Buchanan announced a genuine modernization. A new electric arc mini mill would be built to recycle steel, but it was a mixed blessing. The cost to the steel workers would be enormous. A mini mill would mean the end to traditional labor-intensive steel making in Cape Breton. The workforce a mere 1,200 in 1986 would be further reduced to 700. Demolition began in 1988 with the Coke ovens. The remainder of the old integrated plant, built in 1899, closed forever in 1989. It was the end of a way of life, but the beginning of a healthier environment. The modernization would indeed clean up the environment after nearly a century of dangerous pollution, but there would be even greater unemployment and the young people would continue to leave. Even so, at the plant, the construction for modernization instilled hope for a future in steel. New buildings went up, and the workforce received training for a new, totally computerized operation. The furnace began recycling steel in early 1990, after technical difficulties and over-ambitious startup predictions that were frustrating to both management and the steel workers. Just like its predecessor, built 90 years before, the new mill was proclaimed to be state-of-the-art, this time a miracle of American and European design. It was an electric arc furnace with ladle metallurgy refining, a continuous caster, and a universal mill. The mini mill was promoted as the answer to the fickle swings of world markets, 
for it could be turned off at a moment's notice. As production began, technical difficulties persisted and the threat of layoffs kept the community in fearful anticipation. Then, in early 1992, the provincial government announced its intention to sell Sydney Steel back to the private sector, again leaving the fate of the community in question. History may argue that Cape Breton had all the resources necessary for a successful steel industry. Why then did steel decline in Cape Breton? Was it as simple as a changing world market? Or should we look again at outside control without sufficient reinvestment in the community or the industry? Or at state intervention without enough public participation? Or perhaps the folly of dependence on a single industry with a single product? For the community, which grew with almost 100 years of the steel industry, these questions are more urgent than ever, as it looks to its own resources for a resolution. Sons of steel, people of the land, daughters strong, together we will stand. And we will fight for our pride, with the strength that burns inside. Well, I went to the plant when I was around 17. I knew the job before I left home. Before I ever went to school, we had steel for breakfast, dinner, and supper. That was part of the meal, really. I worked in every department in the plant uh, right from the marsh dump down to the docks. When I went to the plant in 1940, they were making everything. They made nails, rods, bars, and you name it, they made it there. The workforce at that time was probably, in the opener, 700 men, and on the steel plant, four to 5,000. Now, when I left, the opener has only probably about 120 men and 1,200 men on the plant. Uh, the men I started working with uh, uh, broke me in on all different jobs and were good, honest to goodness men, hard workers and older men. And I appreciated what they showed me and I looked up to them. But steam making itself is something always fascinated me. I don't know if it was the flame or the work or the heat or the men, but it was really a, an education just to go into the open earth to work with all those old timers. We were like a family, and uh, everybody was so kind. And every day, there was some little funny thing happen that would make your day, and you couldn't be going around with a long face all the time. There were gangs of women in certain departments, just about every department. They had a gang at the Coke ovens. We used to call in the wheelbarrow brigade, cleaning up along the tracks with coke and cleaning off the top of the battery. And they worked right along with the men. They, we had some women in the rod and bar mill working as inspectors. They were down in the brick sheds, wheeling brick and 
and the supplying brick to the rest of the plant. They worked in the mills, too, as inspectors and cleanup areas and things. But right after the war, they disappeared. <laughs> Whatever the hell happened. When you got your work order, it, it specified this number of teeth to be cut in this pinion to make a gear and the size of the cutter and all this. And you had to be very careful that this would be done to <laughs> that your pinion would come into a proper gear. And I always remember these chips falling and you would have to keep these chips, metal chips cleared. And, we never, for some reason, we were never encouraged or maybe was never thought of to wear gloves working in the shop. I suppose it could be a danger if they were caught in the uh, machines at any time. But anyway, these chips always cut into the tips of my fingers and the oil and grease would get in there. And this bothered me a little, especially if I went to a dance or a social gathering. The fingers were turned in all the time. The brick plant is, was, we made brick up there in a very you know, old method, very basic method, and we made it uh, what we call silica brick, and we were, which was made from limestone. Silicosis was a result of, of breathing the dust from the, from the stone, especially in the kills. And the men worked a lot harder and longer hours and no time off, and an awful lot of them died in early big strong men that died before their time as far as I was concerned. Later years it was better. The plant was uh, something else. It was uh, when you walked in the gate it was like open season on you. Um, you got to be on the lookout for yourself. But that's life in the steel plant. He worked night and day in the dirt and the heat. He tried to earn a dollar to make ends meet. He was a strong man. He was a strong man. He never realized through all of his years, from all of his sweat and all of his fears, he was a strong man. He was a strong man But some folks that cross the strait Are trying to knock him down They just don't realize They also need his strength around He's a strong man He's a strong man Religion played a big part in uh, where you worked on the plant because uh, in the open hearth, which had a Catholic superintendent, you had mostly Catholics there. And in the heavy mills, and the bar mill and rail mill and all, all through there, there was a Protestant superintendent, so therefore you had people from the Orange Lodges and different Mason organizations. You worked with all kinds of nationalities. There was Italians and Polacks and Ukrainians, and you name it, they were there. But there was no uh, colored people allowed on the furnaces. They just didn't take them. Well, most of them worked in the, in the gas producers. It was awful hot and dirty there. They used to have to shovel the coal to make the gas. I never saw anybody uh, with gas, but I did hear of people, you know. I was up there myself a few times, and, you know, uh, very hot up there, very hot up there. And sweat, boy, I'm telling you, that was really something. And for all the places, I said, that, I think that's the closest thing that anybody wants to be. Now all the dirty gases and flames around your clothes And all the filthy things that are going up your nose in the coke oven he was a strong man. It doesn't matter where you are. If you're in a coal covens and the coal covens are on, you could be five miles away. And if the wind is blowing in your direction, you will smell it 
It's just, it's just unreal. It doesn't matter what you did or where you went to hide or whatever, the gas and the dirt were there constantly. The wind is, wind is in the south and in the old days, the standpipes were open and the, the gas would catch fire, you know, and the flame would be overhead and you gotta go underneath and try to, try to get these covers on because if you put that fire out, then the fire is in front of you. So you either, either, either burn me on top or burn me on the bottom. On top of those batteries, with all of that heat He had to wear wooden shoes So he wouldn't burn his feet And the cancer-causing agents All flying around Nobody warned him It was killing him and his town In the coke ovens He was a strong man most of the lunchrooms, they weren't actually lunchrooms. It was little places, you know, wherever it was warm at, uh, that the fellows would make themselves. Polish and uh, Ukrainian fellows, they had a place there made of corrugated iron that was built around the damper. We used to call it uh, Budapest. And uh, there's nothing to stop us from going in there, but we never used to go in because uh, they used to speak their own language in there, and we didn't understand the word, what they were saying. Somebody always wanted something made, and somebody was stealing off to a corner making something. There were little rabbit jobs made all the time. Rabbit jobs, you know what I mean? Well, people wanted uh, some job done for their home, you know, so something cut or made in the machine shop or what have you. I'm sure uh, the other shops were probably doing it too. Uh, foundries and what have you, making grates and like that. Little rabbit jobs could have <laughs> been here or there very often, I would imagine. But uh, well, this was the way of life then. I worked in the foundry. Uh, I helped Mr. Bessett on the cupola. I didn't work on any of the skill jobs as steel pourers or the uh, uh, molders or jobs like that. Uh, that takes a number of years. If they would put you on uh, menial jobs, uh, you know, like cl cleaning or sweeping or uh, something until such time as they want to break you in on uh, operating a crane or a hurdy-gurdy cars or, or anything that was there or to go straightening or drilling, whatever jobs. And what they would do, they would um, put you with a senior man for weeks until you were able to do it by yourself. It, it was on the job training, and uh, when they needed an extra man, they had them. He's a strong man. You take a little bit of iron and a little bit of scrap. You add a lot of fire, but always watch behind your back in the open hearth. He was a strong man. A lot of men that were, especially the, the old timers, they liked their feed of corned beef and cabbage on night shift or herring and potatoes, which is another dish. They would boil it in a bucket and then they would wash their shovel off and put their bacon on it or an egg or capelin, whichever it was they'd have for their lunch, they would bake it right on the shovel in front of a people. They had the big soup spoon, I call it. He'd dip in until he got a good spoonful. He'd pour in the box, he said to me, get a piece of aluminum wire. Just keep jigging up and down the box. When I went in there, it, was, it wasn't book learning, it was all from just practical experience. You learn from the older men. For instance, now, if you took a test, they would break a test and they would look at it. And they could tell you when they broke the test if it was in within two or four points of what the carbon that they wanted. And not only that, they could tell the condition of the heat. If it was dirty, if it had phosphorus in it or sulfur, they could tell by looking at this piece of steel. So then I got the test. He said, all right, breaker. He said, I'll have a look at it. In them days, the old guy would look at it. Yeah, give her a pan of lime, he said. She's ready. 
Working next to a furnace pushing 3,000 degrees. You're wishing for a cold one and a real cool breeze in the open earth. He was a strong man. Young was started oh, back in the early 30s. It didn't become a source of strength until shortly after the war. And from then on, it started becoming much more involved with the lives of the employees. And, and it became a great union. I'm sure that the people who worked in the, in the steel plant were, were awful happy that they had a union to work in their own interests, to assure that they got the benefits of their worth. The first big strike really was 1943. And that was the day that I joined the union. It's a, a union to me, I didn't know too much. In later years, you had to just join as soon as you were employed at that time. So the man came along and said, he in the union? I said, no. You see, you going to sign the card? And I said, yes. And, and we went home. We were out that time for about two or three weeks. I was a union man all my life. I wouldn't want to work without a union. It gave the workers a lot of protection. It was better for the working man because the senior, if they went by seniority, the senior man always moved ahead if he could handle the promotions, like, you know, if you were capable of doing it. The mill that I worked in was a good mill. Harmony was terrific. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would get up early in the morning and want to make it out to work an hour earlier uh, so that I could sit down and have a coffee and talk and carry on. Uh, you wouldn't believe the harmony that was in the mill. The morale was so high, and there was always someone there with a joke to tell. But there was always a good bunch of boys. Um, I guess there was a bit of, uh, you know, cutthroats and cutthroating in there, but uh, people trying to get over one another or getting over the other fellows to try to get a better job. And there is that in almost every walk of life. But uh, it really wasn't that noticeable there, not as far as I was concerned. I used to look forward to going to work, but after they closed that mill down, I had 13 years of pure hell, as far as I'm concerned. I did not enjoy going to work. I just put in the time and wished my life away, wishing that I was of age or put in the years so that I can get my pension and leave. Screeching packed all around, sounding like a jet plane. Be prepared to run, cause this ain't no game in the blast furnace. He was a strong man. Well, actually, the furnace was your boss. What I mean by that, as she was melting, the, the, the stock was dropping in the furnace, so you had to keep, the, keep it full all the time. The gas, especially blast furnace gas, was terrible because it snuck up on you. Not only from blowing up, but it was toxic. And there was always a chance of an explosion. Well, you poke another gate and you watch the iron come. You breathe a lot of sulfur and observe that old slag run in the blast furnace. He was a strong man. There was three of them killed, Sheaves, Spar, and Henry Gear. The night that it happened, they had to see, see some steam coming out, and they were trying to get her going when they had that, when she broke out. The cast house was just filled, the furnace emptied right out in the cast house when she let go. Hot coke and all, we couldn't get in there, but a little after midnight, it was cool down sufficient. We got in around the back, and we found them just outside the building. They were burnt very badly burnt with the violent explosions coming from the slag pit. They didn't have any clothing or anything left on. They were burnt right to a crisp. And we found Henry Gear was on the slope. When Rome and I were picking up, he, he, one of his arms uh, fell off and he was right hot with grease and everything. They were burnt just black. But some folks across the street are trying to knock them down They just don't realize They also need His strength around He's a strong man He's 
the strong man You have to learn to lay the land, so to speak, eh? And I pay attention, take my time. Sometimes when I'm taking a sling of hot steel, what you call a cobble away, and I lift up, and I rackle, and I bridge down the mill. Now sometimes the steel starts turning. Now that's really tricky, because you got to try to bring it back to make your way down where you don't damage anything. You gotta be careful. It's nerve wracking. I don't like it. I, I'm looking for a nice job. I can't, you know. I don't know if I get used to it. They're dumping the swag over to the steel plant. They're dumping the swag in the middle of the night. They're dumping the swag over to the steel plant. Go back to bed, Mama. Everything will be all right. Our homes and stilled our fears and made the 